Well, hello, everybody, and shalom. Glad you could join us again for another installment of the FM International Ministries teaching series. Um, today is a special day for everybody that, that uh, is following the, uh, the calendar that we follow. Today is the Day of Atonement. And although I'm not going to be teaching on the Day of Atonement, I, I would like to read a few scriptures that I'll uh, get into right after we do our morning prayer. But uh, hope your week has been a blessed week. We're in the middle of, actually, this is the end of the 10, what's called the 10 days of awe, the 10 awesome days between uh, the Feast of Trumpets and today. And um, I just hope your week has been a blessed week. It's time of reflection, a time to consider uh, maybe things that have slipped, things that we let go by, uh, that we need to discuss with the Lord, uh, repent from those things and get those things right as we move into the new year. Today, guys, I'm going to uh, be teaching on the topic of what does the New Testament have to say about keeping Torah? What does the New Testament have to say about keeping Torah? And of course, uh, this uh, teaching, like the other ones on Torah, all based on the teachings of Prophet Tom Decker. So with that being said, uh, I always like to say this. I hope that something I say or uh, that the Lord allows me to say will be used uh, can be used in your life as a stepping stone, as, as a seed that can help you accomplish that which God has set forth for you from the foundations of the world and that you will reach your destiny. So with that, we're going to go to God in prayer. Then I'd like to read a few scriptures and we'll get into our teaching for this morning. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> thank you again, Father, for the opportunity to assemble in this convocation with all those that are listening to me live and those that might listen to this recording once it gets on YouTube. Father God, I, I pray nothing but blessings upon all of those. And for those who are enlightened and know what's happening, may this day of atonement be a, a, a time of reflection. May it be a time of uh, going back and uh, examining the things that we have left, uh, may have left that slipped and we can go back and take care of that thing with you. We know as Christians, and people who keep Torah, that Lord, any time we sin, we can come to you in the name of Yeshua and repent of our sins and receive the cleansing of our sins by the holy blood of Yeshua. But because this day of atonement has been set up by you, Heavenly Father, is something that we're gonna do forever. We're gonna observe this day to the best of our ability so that we can be in compliance with Torah. Lord, I thank you for all of the blessings you've given us, the food, the water, the homes, transportation, health, clothing us in our right mind, the, the, the happiness and well-being of our families, whatever the, it may be, all of those blessings come from you. We want to say thank you in the name of Yeshua. But Lord, just like we said, if we let something slip this past week, please forgive us. And may the holy blood of Yeshua be a cleansing, not only for our sins, but for the sins of our family. Lord God, I pray a special blessing upon this teaching. Lord, the words that come out of my mouth, even if they come out incorrectly or wrong, Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would work on those things. And by the time people hear them, they'll hear exactly what you wanted them to hear, the way you wanted them to hear it. Darkness, I'm serving notice on you. You're not welcome here. So back off and get out of this meeting. Take your hands off the technology. Take your hands off the houses and homes that are represented uh, here. And be gone in the name of Yeshua. You're not welcome, and I do not give you permission to invade this convocation. So be gone in the name of Yeshua. These things, Father, we thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Guys, I want to read this. And this is Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, starting at verse, let's see. I'm going to start at verse 27, Leviticus 23, 27. And this pertains to this special day, this day called the Day of Atonement. Some people call it Yom Kippur. And on the 10th day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work <clears throat> in that same day, 
for it is a day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it shall be that doeth any work in that same day, the same, same soul will I destroy from among my people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And it shall, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. That is what this day is, and that is what we're going to do, because that is what God has commanded us to do, to keep the Torah. And that is what we're going to talk about, Torah. This is not a lecture in showing you things that maybe some other people don't know. It's not a showing off thing. This is how we live. This is what God has required of us. God defines loving him as those that keep his commandments. John 15, 14, 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keeping the day of atonement is one of his commandments, and that is exactly what we're going to do. And if it's something that you guys haven't done, I would implore you and encourage you to rethink that and to get busy keeping God's law, even on one of these most holy days of the year. It is a Sabbath. It just so happens to coincide with the seven-day Sabbath, so the two days are kind of coinciding with one another, overlapping one another, so that's, that's good. All right, we're going to talk about what does the New Testament have to say about keeping the Torah. So again, Torah means God's divine instruction. And the only way that we have to understand whether or not we're living a life of righteousness or a life of unrighteousness or sin is to know the divine instruction given by God, his laws slash his commandments. The only way you know you're doing the right thing, the only way you know you're not doing the right thing is you got to have a rule book. And God was so gracious that he, he inspired holy men and holy women to document these things so that we could go back and read them. How, what kind of a God is it that would be so loving that we don't have to guess at it, it's written right down there for you to go read it and do it. And for the most part, people in the church or in other ministries are not great students of the Bible. We are sometimes students of the doctrines that they teach. That, what that is saying is that, and I was one of them when I was young, I rarely read the Bible. I depended on my pastor to be my Bible. Whatever he said or whatever she said, that's what I did. I didn't dig into the scriptures myself. I let other people, one of my famous lines, do the heavy lifting for me. So all I had to do is just show up on Sunday, kind of hear what they said. And if it kind of moved me, I'd do it. And if it didn't, I didn't do it. That's not going to cut it in this day and time. God is requiring each one of his children to stand on your own two feet, to mature, to move on to perfection. The Bible says perfection, which is maturity. On You can't lean on somebody else to do your maturing for you. You got to do it yourself. Are you a seeker of what God has to say? Or are you just satisfied with what others tell you to believe and no scriptures to back it up? All of us are going to have to decide individually that we're going to believe on our own. And we better make sure that what we believe is based on scripture. In a lot of cases, people will have to do a lot of unlearning before they can learn correctly. And unlearning is a tough proposition because some people are convinced or have convinced themselves that what they believe is the bottom line. There's nothing else. What I've, I've heard my pastor, I've done my study, and I just know what I know what I know. And I'm not going to accept anything else that pushes me off that point. It's also tough because you will have to admit that you what you thought was right really is not right. I went through it. My wife went through it. The way we taught our sons, they went through it on their own. And there may be people listening to me right now that have already gone through it. But there may be people who don't agree with me, and that's your right, that's your privilege. But I'm telling you, God is, 
is always and will always have revelation knowledge that'll take you deeper into the understanding of his word. It never stops. It's a continuing thing until God sends Yeshua back, this thing is gonna go on and on and on. And just because you understand that something, even if it's based on Torah or the Bible, there's still a deeper understanding of his word. There always will be. We'll never learn everything there is everything there is to know about God. He's always ever revealing. Now, take the rapture as an example. Nobody knows the percentage of churches that believe that teaching, but that could not be further from the truth. I had a, I was telling my wife, I had a, a Facebook, uh, I'll call it a dialogue with this guy out here in the islands. And uh, he was trying to tell me, I didn't know what I was talking about, about the rapture, because there would be a catch in the way. I mean, the Bible talks about we'll meet God in the air and, and all of this stuff. But what, like I was telling them, you don't know when that's gonna happen. There's no scripture that says it's gonna be a pre-trip rapture or a mid-trip rapture. There's no timing on it. And, and the real thing is that look at the biblical patterns. There's never been an example, never been an example in the Bible where God took his people off the earth and brought them back down to the earth after the judgment. They were, they were right here on the earth and went through it. Goshen, remember Goshen? When Israel was in Egypt, this certain area that they stayed and uh, some of the plagues would come and affect Egypt, specifically the hail, it did not affect Israel. It was protected. When you look at the classic example, the flood, Noah and his family didn't get shot up to heaven and come back after the flood. They stayed right here. They went through it. And the other example, Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his family didn't shoot up to heaven when God fired, uh, rained down uh, fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. They were right smack here on the earth. They got delivered out of it. There's no pattern of God shooting you up to heaven judging the world and shooting you back. We're going to go right through it. So the people that believe in the rapture, like prophet used to tell us, they need to unpack their rapture suitcases because they won't need them. Look at the patterns. Look at the patterns. God is a God of patterns. But anyway, there are no scriptures that support a pre-trip or mid-trip escape off the earth. People are going to remain right here and they're going to go through it all the way. All right, let's get back to Torah. What kind of God, I just said this, what kind of God is this whom we serve that will take the time to put down for us so we can know what he wants or how he wants us to live? The instructions so he can guide our lives and bless us. He took the time to inspire these people to write it down so in our generation, all these thousands of years to this very moment, we can go back and read not only what the rules are, we, he, he documented historically what happened when Israel did the laws, what happened to them, and what happened to Israel when they didn't do the laws, what happened. What makes us think we're different than those same patterns will happen to us? If we do what Israel did when they kept the Torah, God blessed them, protected them. He fought armies, uh, foreign uh, armies for them. He did the fighting. And look what happened when they didn't do it. The armies came and invaded them, killed them, stole their stuff, defeated them, burnt down their stuff. All kind of bad things happened to Israel when they didn't keep it. And if you're, we're God's people, just like Israel's God's people, we're part of the house of Israel, what makes us think we're immune to that pattern? We're not. If you keep the Torah, you're blessed. If you don't, you won't be blessed. Don't let anybody fool you into thinking that grace Sur supplants or supersedes obedience to keeping his laws because it doesn't only thing grace does which is a very important thing is allows us through faith in the death burial and resurrection and the shedding of his holy blood to accept or, or, or allow us to receive i should say eternal life through the finished work of the lord yeshua the christ the messiah the mashiach now, there are some doctrines out there that say that once you become saved, you cannot sin no matter what. Hey, look, look at this. If that's true, then we can steal, murder, lie, 
be gluttons, do all this stuff, and we're still going to be okay. And that is simply not true. And this can all be summed up by this statement that's a lack of knowledge. The scripture says that people, God's people are destroyed through a lack of knowledge. And I didn't notice till I read it myself. That's Hosea 4, 6. If you want to go read it, we're not going to read it in this lesson. But they would all teach on the first line. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, which is 100% true. But they never read the whole verse. And at the back of that verse, it says, because my people have forgotten the law of God. The laws of God. That's why they're being destroyed for lack of knowledge, because the knowledge is in keeping the Torah. There's a lack of people studying God's word for themselves. We need to know the whole counsel of God's word to make it in this life. Okay, the subject of this lesson is what does the New Testament have to say? So let's flip over to the New Testament, go to Romans 7. Starting at verse 25, we're going to explore several scriptures in the New Testament to dispel if there's any doubt about Torah is just an Old Testament thing, whatever the Old Testament is. It was just built for Jews in Israel back in that time. It doesn't have nothing to do with the modern church. That could be not further from the truth. It, I mean, it could be further from the truth. It's not true. Romans 7 25 I thank God through Yeshua Christ our Lord so then with the with the mind I serve the law of God but with the flesh the law of sin so here's another example of the apostle Paul that he kept the law of God with his mind but he was always battling with his flesh there was this constant war going on between his mind trying to serve God and his flesh that was not trying to serve God and sin was always present. But the point being, Paul said with his mind, he served the law of God. Why would Paul say that about himself and then make this statement that some churches believe that I've been redeemed from the curse? That would make Paul one of the biggest hypocrites that God ever created. And that's not what he meant. I showed you last week, sometimes Paul's writings were difficult to understand. And if you don't know it, you can walk away with a wrong interpretation and run with that and think you, you know it and you missed the whole point. Flip over a page and let's go to Romans 8, 1. Romans 8, starting at verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Yeshua, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Yeshua hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Stop. So again, we see that the law was not created by God to get you eternal life. The death, burial, and resurrection and the shedding of Yeshua's holy blood for the remission of your sins was set up to take care of the sin problem and to get us eternal life or the earnest of eternal life. Until when you die, then you actually you get it. Verse 3, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. And I want you to really, really catch the next two verses. For to be carnally minded is death but to be spirit Spiritually minded is life and peace. Seven, because the carnal mind is enmity or hatred against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Look at verse six. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded, spiritually minded is life and peace. Then you go to seven. It talks about being carnally minded is war or hostility or hatred against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. So what he's saying is that the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, but the spiritual mind is subject to the law of God. Did you catch that? To be spiritually minded is life and peace, and it is subject to the law of God. The carnal mind can't be, because the carnal mind is after the things of the flesh. Are you getting that? 
If you are saved, born again, that kind of thing, and you have given your life over to God through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Yeshua and his finished work, you have positioned yourself to be spiritually minded. And if you are, then you are subject to the law of God. That's right there in the New Testament, guys. If you're still running around following your flesh and doing fleshly lust, you can't be spiritually minded because you're not subject to the law of God. Eight. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So basically, if you are spiritually minded, you position yourself to be subject to the law of God and you will please God. If you're carnally minded, you haven't accepted Yeshua, you don't care about those kind of things, you're still living in the flesh, you're carnally minded, and A says, if you're in the flesh, you can't please God. Did you get that? I hope you got it. I explained it the best way I could. To be spiritually minded, then you are subject to the law of God, the law of God, the laws of God. So the scripture tells us that by grace we're saved through faith. That's Ephesians 2.8. You can read that offline. And since that has been enacted by our Heavenly Father, we can now keep the Torah without fear or condemnation. What does that mean? Even if you mess up, if you break the law or you, you just mess up, you're not You've been redeemed from that curse. You're not going to burn in hell because salvation has covered that for you. His grace has covered that for you. Now I can keep the law without the curse bothering me. Got it? The curse of the law is that you couldn't get eternal life. Well, if you kept every 613 mitzvot, if you kept them all perfectly, which no man can, you still wouldn't get eternal life. There's only one door to God. That's through the door of Yeshua the Christ. But after you get that, guys, I'm, I'm telling you, it is vitally life uh, important that you keep the Torah. You got to. How will you know if you've sinned unless you know the rules? How do you know that you're doing the right thing unless you know the rules, the law of the rules? You can't just know this stuff by osmosis. You have to study these things so you can live a life of righteousness. You can live a life of holiness. You do it by keeping his rules. So with so much access to bookstores and being online and CDs and DVDs, we really have no excuse for not knowing what God requires of us for living here in this life. There's no excuse. I believe that each person has to break away from their denominational doctrines and make sure what you believe is based on God's word and not some doctrinal handbook or what somebody told you. And if there is no solid scriptural support for what you are doing, then you have to decide yourself if you want to keep doing that or change. And you might ask Ernest, change to what? There's only one thing you can change to, keeping the law of God, the Torah, the covenant. Again, if you're serious about uh, seeking after the, the things of the spirit, then your spiritual mind will be subject to the law of God. It didn't say you're going to be subject to the grace of God, which is great and you need it because that's where salvation comes through. It didn't talk about that. It talked about the law. And I said grace because some people have told my wife and me, we're not, we're not under the law. We're under grace. Like grace is some kind of magic umbrella that means I don't have to keep a law. And, and unfortunately, that's in the church. A lot of churches, they believe that lie and they're going to pay the price for it one day. You've got to keep God's Torah. And I've got my hands up because I've, like I said in previous teachings, that was me. I was just, what I just said described me and my wife because we didn't think we needed to keep the law. You couldn't keep it anyway because Jesus Christ came and he uh, fulfilled the law, i.e., he got rid of it. He, he, he fulfilled it so I don't have to do it because I couldn't do it anyway. That's false teaching. I'm, I'm telling you for the past three weeks, including today, that the, the word of God saying you are subject to the law of God. I made this comment. I was talking to my wife this morning, uh, Romans 3.31. It's kind of like one of my favorite scriptures. 
And, and, when, and the Apostle Paul, the one that everybody's saying we've been deep from the curse of the law, which we have been, but they took the wrong way. He said in Romans 3.31, do we make void the law of God through faith? And I may not be quoting it exactly, but you get the point. You go read it yourself. Do we make void the law of God through faith? God forbid we establish the law. It's our job as an Ephraimite to preach it, teach it, live it, plant seeds in other people so they know the importance of keeping God's Torah after you get saved. No person, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Hold on a second. Everybody turn to Colossians 2.14. Colossians 2.14, and again, Paul wrote this to the church of Colossae, Colossae. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. And I'll explain that in a second. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day, which today is a holy day, or of the new moon, Rosh Kodesh, or of the Sabbath days. No person, no man, no woman, no boy or girl can work and earn salvation. If you kept all of the laws to a T, that still would not earn you eternal life. And that was the curse of the law. Christ nailed that to the cross and redeemed us from the curse, and now we are saved by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, 8 again. We can now move forward to keep the Torah without that curse continually condemning us. He took the handwriting of ordinances, verse uh, 14, that was against us because the ordinances did, could not give us eternal life. And he, when they nailed him to the cross, he took that to the cross and defeated that curse. That redeemed us from the curse of the law. It's through him that the curse of the law was defeated. The curse again, again, and again is that you could not get eternal life through keeping the law. It wasn't designed to save you. It was designed to bless you and define for you what sin was or is. 17, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Drop down to verse 20. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? And when I read that before I, I learned what it said, why am I subject to ordinances? In my mind, why am I subject to God's ordinances? That is not what it's saying. Read it in context. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, as though living in the world, are ye subject to the ordinances of the world? Worldly ordinances, not scriptural ordinances, worldly ordinances, the rules of the world. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. Did you get it? Those ordinances were man's ordinances. Why are you being subject to that junk? Why not be subject to the ordinances of the God Almighty? We put more credence on man's ordinances than God's. And you can get into scriptural fights. The prophet would talk about this fights in, in parking lots over stuff in the church. Arguments, man. Arguments over something man made up. The church that we used to go to, I'm not gonna name it, but you've heard, if you listen to me, you know what I'm gonna say. They had this book called the Discipline. I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna call it the Methodist Discipline that went along with the Bible. And in that book, it had the rights for baptism, the rights for burial, the rights for all this other stuff. They had these seasons called Advent, Christmas Tide, uh, Lent, Lent, last time I lent that stuff that's in your navel, but Lent, and they slap this stuff upside your head, this black stuff upside your head, and for 40 days, you had to give up something. 
That's an ordinance of man. That ain't nowhere in the scripture. But if you go, there's a certain denomination I'm sure you're aware of. If you go talk about that, you're going to get into a big theological debate about it because they believe that junk. But it ain't scriptural. It ain't scriptural. Anyway, moving on. Uh, Colossians 3.1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's just a, a, a follow up to the scripture we just read. We're not, let's don't set our affections on man's ordinances and worldly rules and stuff that people made up and are masquerading as God's rules. Uh-uh. God's rules are not that hard, guys. You just got to go do them. Now, there are rules in the Torah that we can't keep because the temple is not there and we don't, we don't kill animals uh, to get our sins forgiven because Christ is, the, is the, uh, the last Lamb of God, okay? So we don't have to do all that stuff. And since the temple is not there, we can't do a lot of these things. A lot of the laws have to do with, with the priesthood and the Levites, which we're not. So, but the links that we can keep, we're supposed to keep those things. And those things, you have the confidence in knowing that if God said it, and if you do those things, you're in good stead with God. If you start doing all this junk that man says to do, you could do it to the T. And like I've been saying, one day when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's not going to judge you on whether or not you kept man's rules. Mm -hmm. Matthew 7, he's going to say, I don't even know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You didn't keep the laws. So Paul was explaining, uh, oh, I want to go to Galatians 5.3. Let me do that. I'm getting ahead of myself. Then I'll explain it. One verse, Galatians 5.3. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So what Paul was explaining, if you read verse 3, 4, 5, which I'm not going to read, and you get it in context, this whole section of scripture was where Paul was explaining that males were to be circumcised on the eighth day uh, after they were born, and if not, any time after that. And this is the law. But Paul was explaining that it was not required for salvation. The two ideas are mutually exclusive. You got circumcised to obey the law, but not to become saved. That simply required faith in Christ and what he did. All right. 1 Corinthians 6.12, 1 Corinthians 6.12. Again, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, Corinth. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So Paul here is explaining that he was free under Torah to do whatever Torah allowed him to do, although the Gentiles and others might not have agreed with that. He just had to use discretion when doing it. And also, since he was free to keep Torah, he was not going to let a majority of Jews or Gentiles sway him from doing what he was doing, which was preaching the gospel and keeping the Torah. He kept the Torah, but he still preached the gospel of Yeshua. 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. Paul is writing to Gentiles at the church of Corinth. He's not writing to the Jews. He's writing to Gentile believers who accepted Paul's preaching of the gospel and received Yeshua as their Christ. He's saying in verse 2, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances. What ordinances were there? The ordinances of God, the Torah. He was telling them to keep the Torah. As I delivered it to you, again, Paul would have been the biggest hypocrite that God ever created to tell all these other people not to do it, but he was doing it. And that's not what he did. He kept the law and he told other people, Gentiles, church folk, to keep it too. So don't let anybody fool you. Paul was not speaking to heathens. He was speaking to the church at Corinth. He told them and us that we ought to follow him as he followed Christ and keep the laws, the ordinances, 
as God gave them to us. Flip all the way back to Acts 21. We're talking about what does the New Testament have to say about keeping the Torah. And hopefully you're getting it. I know you're getting it. By faith you're getting it. Acts 21, 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they were all zealous of the law. Again, just as another example of the Jews who accepted Yeshua. But they weren't taught drop the law. Hey, grace, uh, when you get the grace of salvation, grace covered the law, Yeshua fulfilled the law, drop all that junk y'all was doing, you don't have to do the law no more. That is not what Paul said. The Jews accepted Yeshua and they kept on keeping the law. They were zealous of the law. Flip, flip back. Sorry, guy, you guys flipping back and forth. Go to 2 Thessalonians, sorry. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. One verse. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle or letter. What are the traditions? What do you think Paul was telling the church at Thessalonica? What do you think he was telling them? Oh, Thessalonians, excuse me. Those traditions were the law. That's the only thing he could. There was no New Testament then. He was teaching them the law, the Torah. That's the traditions which you have been taught. And it doesn't matter if we taught it to you verbally, by word, or if we wrote it to you in the law, in, in a letter. Keep the Torah. Now, if you don't know, we are responsible for everything that is written in the scriptures. We can never use the excuse, Lord, we simply didn't know on that day. It's not going to cut it, guys. And in order that we get ready for that day, it is important that we keep on studying and that we set ourselves to be ready to stand before the Lord Yeshua at the great white throne judgment. Excuse me, excuse me. The judgment seat of Christ, at the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go to Matthew 5, 17. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I am come, whew, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but fulfill. I've already pounded on that enough, guys. The Lord Yeshua didn't come to negate the law so that we don't have to keep it. Since nobody could keep it, he's the only that could keep it. He fulfilled it. So I don't have to keep it no more. That's not what that word fulfill means. So this is the son of almighty God speaking here. And what did Yeshua fulfill? He fulfilled what the law could not produce. He fulfilled by grace through faith, the right for us to have his salvation, eternal life. So here we are. Guys, if God said it, just believe it. So what we are now seeing is that folks will believe what God said up to a point where it conflicts the doctrine that they chose to believe. They allowed their doctrine to take precedence over the word of God. Again, the number of times that you've heard this before, revelation knowledge, the secrets of God only come to God's servants, his prophets. That's Amos 3, 7. It doesn't come to pastors, teachers, apostles, or evangelists. I'm sorry, but your pastor ain't going to get the revelation knowledge or the secrets of God. It ain't coming to him. I'm sorry. You can find all the scriptures you want, but go back and read Amos 3, 7, because it's not there. Sure, God speaks to everybody. He speaks to you. He speaks to me. He speaks to pastors and all these other offices of the fivefold ministry. He sure does. But the secrets only come from the prophets, the revelation knowledge, the change in direction we're going to take. I've often heard it said that the prophets are the mouthpiece of God. They're like the GPS. They set the direction for God's people. Then all these other officers teach it to it and explain it and break it down so people understand it in, in, a, in, a, in a language and in a way that they can get it. Verse 18 of Matthew 5. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth will disappear before one jot or one tittle of the law passes. And since heaven and earth is still here, then the law is still in effect. 
is here to stay. And fulfill does not mean got rid of, it means complete. He completed the part that the law was never set up to do. Matthew 7, 12. Flip over a few pages. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye have that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. All right. Again, this is the Lord Yeshua speaking to us. What some people call the golden rule, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. The Bible says, this is the law and the prophets, the law, the law, the law. And this is in what this is so-called contained in the New Testament. The law, the law, this so-called golden rule comes from the law. We are supposed to keep the law, even Gentiles, the law. We as Ephraimites, and we understand as an Ephraimite, we're no more than Israel that got cast to the four corners of the world, living amongst the Gentiles. And our ancestors took on the Gentile ways, the Gentile beliefs. But we're still Ephraim. We're still God's people. And there's a lot of people in the world today that don't even know that they're Israelites living amongst the Gentiles. And it's our job to let them know, plant that seed for them to consider it, because maybe they are Ephraim. But the point being, in the New Testament, we are to keep the law and the prophets, the law. Your golden rule is contained in the law. Let's go on. And for anyone to think that if you keep the law, you're going to give up your salvation and go to hell, that couldn't be further from the truth. Just see the previous scripture. He just said, this so-called golden do on others as you would have them to do and you came right from the law. Right from the law. And if you believe that, then you have to believe the law. God set the laws that are in place and they will stay in place until he decides to change it and only God can do it. And he hasn't done it. Now things are going to get tough in the days ahead and we better hang on to this uh, this, this God and keep his laws, but through it all, Ephraim will be saved, through it all. God has, de has determined that Ephraim is still the apple of his eye. And you can go read that in Deuteronomy 32, 7 through 10 off land, where he talks about Israel and he talks about his people. We are the apple of God's eye. And if you're the apple of God's eye, God's going to do certain things for you that he's not doing for other people because we're going to keep his laws. And just like any parent, those that are listening to me that are parents, when you tell your children and you give them chores or whatever, clean your room, take out the, whatever you tell them, and they do those kinds of things consistently, that affects you as a parent. So when the child asks you for something that's in your power to do it, you're more likely to give it to them versus a child that doesn't do their chores, they're mouthing off to you, they do what they want to do. They're, they're being a disobedient child. And then that child has the nerve to come at you. Hey, dad, can I use the car? Hey, mom, can you can you give me five dollars? And you haven't done any of the stuff and you got the nerve to ask me that. Well, what do you think our Heavenly Father's doing? You won't do what I'm telling you to do. You made up these rules, but you're praying to me and asking me for this and for that and do this and do that. But you won't do what I'm telling you to do. What do you think as a heavenly parent? Our Heavenly Father is going to do when you pray that way. You answer that. I'm not going to answer that. Matthew 12, 25. Matthew 12, 25. <clears throat> and Yeshua knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. The reason why we have such a mess in church and in ministries too is that we have divided ourselves on what we believe. There's, there's so many denominations on beliefs, misinterpretations of God's word. Although people may come up with a good idea or a good theory, let's agree to just go with God said. Let's just keep the Torah. Let's stop going by what some guys got together and, and voted on or agreed on or what the majority said doing all this junk that Constantine and his mama started. A bunch of guys got together and decided it. 
or, or Constantine's mama and Constantine decided to enforce this junk because they didn't want to have nothing to do with the Jews. And this same thought process has been going on for century after century after century. If we could all just agree to just keep the tour, we can pull this thing together. There's one set of laws for one people to get into one heaven by one God, one Son of God, and one Holy Spirit. There ain't two sets of rules, two gods, two Jesuses. There's one. There's unity in one. Stop making up rules and just use the ones he gave us. Hebrews 8.10. What does the New Testament have to say about keeping the Torah? For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. I submit to you, why would God Almighty in this so-called New Testament put this verse in here? It's also in Jeremiah 31, 31. But why would he put it again in the so-called New Testament and say to, to his children, his people, if we're not supposed to keep the law, I'm going to take the time and I'm going to put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts. If he didn't want us to keep it, why put it there? Evidently, he wanted us to think about it. And from my heart, he wanted us to keep them. That's why. He did it because we're still under the dominion, if I can say that way, of the Torah. He never got rid of it, nor will he ever get rid of it. The rules are still in place. They're not just for Jews. They're for his people. If you consider yourself a child of God, this pertains to you. Malachi, we're going to flip back and do a verse in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament, and I'm going to end with a verse in the Old Testament because I think it summarizes everything we've been talking about for the past three weeks. Malachi 3, 6. Very important verse. He says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. I am the Lord, and I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. God has never wavered on, on, on his people keeping the Torah. I haven't changed. God hasn't changed. If he gave those laws to his people at Mount Sinai, those things are still in effect. If you consider yourself God's people, you're a child of God, he doesn't have two sets of children. He's got one. There's no black children, white children, Hispanic children, Asian children. There's one children, one people. All these man-made things that are dividing pe people, don't fall for that junk. This is a ministry that's not pushing BLM and all that, and to, or Republicans. They ain't got, that's not what we're here for. We're here to teach Torah, Yeshua, righteousness and holiness. And that is not subject to your race, your nationality, your whatever, that doesn't, we're here pulling this thing together if we can. And the unifying thing, guys, is the Torah, it's Yeshua. It's those things that don't divide, they pull together. It's man's junk that divides us. Let's come back to what God said and pull this thing together or try to. I am the Lord and I change not. That's, that's what God is saying in Malachi 3.6. This thing is unified. Man divided it up because we started having misinterpretations of Paul and all this other stuff and all these denominations grew. Thousands of denominations, thousands of things, and it shouldn't be. There are 613 mitzvot, I already said that, M-I-T-Z-B-O-T, basically 613 laws. And they end with the comment that I am Adonai, your God in Hebrew. And whenever you see God placing his stamp on something with his holy name, that is eternal. Now, James, the half-brother of Yeshua, ruled that there were four commandments. He didn't rule it. He basically suggested it in Acts 15, 13 to 21. Read that outline. 
four basic commandments that serve as a bare minimum for Gentiles to join the new covenant synagogues back in the first century church. Something we is referred to sometimes as the Noahide covenant. Number one, to refrain from sexual sin or adultery. That's in Exodus 2014, the law. Number two, thou shalt have no other gods before Adonai, Exodus 20, verse three, the law. Number three, refrain from blood, Leviticus 426, contained in the law. And number four, and from things strangled to eat, Leviticus 17, 13. And this constituted the beginning set of laws taught to new Gentile converts. Did you hear that? Gentile believers were taught the law in the beginning church. Man came by, changed it all up. Constantine and his mama and all these other denominations broke away from what the first century church was doing and started doing something else and misteaching what Paul said. Go back to the beginning. This is what they did. And th you're talking about the, uh, the uh, disciples and the elders who were in that big meeting. When Paul came there, they had the big meeting. And it wasn't Paul that came up with this idea. It was James. The leader of the church didn't come up with the idea. It was James, not Paul. Excuse me, not Peter. Not Peter. Delete that. It wasn't Peter that came up with the answer. It was James. And he came up with these four ideas, and it sounded good to the rest of the brethren. They agreed to it. They wrote a letter, sent it back, and they, they, it said that as, they, as these Gentile believers would go to synagogue on guess what day, guys? It wasn't Sunday. It was the Sabbath day. They're going to have Moses taught to them. What is Moses? The Torah, the laws. So the beginner set of laws came from the law, and the beginning uh, Gentile believers in the first century church were taught the law. Why did we stop doing that? That's what the New Testament says about keeping the Torah. We never should have left. And like I just got through saying, all these man-made things that are dividing us, doctrinally, social, economically, the answer is to come back to the Torah and do what God says. That's a unifying thing. Will it happen? You answer that question. The beginning of the church taught the Christians the laws. Here's my thought here. God says, I am the Lord and I change not. If I commanded my children to learn the law, to keep the law, excuse me, from the time I gave it to Moses, I require it to be learned and kept in every generation since then. Heaven and earth will pass away before the law passes away, and that won't happen. So the divine instruction, the Torah, was given. So if we will keep it, it will allow our lives to change and to be blessed. And I want to end with this scripture. Everybody turn to Proverbs 7, 2, one verse. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 2. It says, keep my commandments and live Keep my commandments, guys, and live. It didn't say keep grace and live. It said keep my commandments and live. And the law as the apple of thine eye. I'm going to end with that. May the Lord add a blessing to this teaching. I hope something was said during this, uh, this uh, series that blessed your life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you took the words. And you did what only you can do. So by the time the people heard what I said, they heard what you wanted them to hear and not me. Guys, God bless you. God keep you. Uh, enjoy and, and uh, the rest of this day as you celebrate and observe the Day of Atonement. And if it be God's will, we'll get back together again next week. So Shabbat Shalom and goodbye.